Good evening, everyone. Guten Abend. Um, I, I want to explain that I'm not going to stand up, but I think all of you can see me if I'm sitting here. Uh, I'm in some problem. I have some problems of back pain at the moment, and anyone who knows what that's like knows that you don't want to stand up for a long period of time. So I want to thank you all for coming. I want to particularly thank the Wissenturm and Harald Wildfeldner, who has done all of the organizing. And tonight, the discussion will be started by Annalisa and by Wiltrud, who just gave me that kind introduction. I'm sorry I can't speak to you in your own language. It pretty much stops at Guten Abend and Dankeschön. So we'll get started. But first I have to look for my clock, which I forgot to do while I was sitting there, so, so I don't go over time and keep on and on and on. And our interpreter this evening is Alexandra, and I've just had a conversation with her, and I know that she's going to be extraordinarily competent. So if you don't follow the English, have no fear. Alexandra will be taking you through everything I think that I want to say. Is, is the mic right for all of you? Yes? Any problems? No? Great. Thank you to the technician, who I know is also very competent. Um, I would like to, to divide this talk this evening about the crisis of democracy into three parts, because I'm very preoccupied at the moment with what I call the rise of illegitimate authority. And in order to talk about illegitimate authority governing us, I think we first have to decide what is legitimate in a democracy. So I'll do that very quickly. Um, th the second part is to, I want to state my hypothesis, which is that democracy, I believe, is in serious danger of being completely overtaken by neoliberalism, and if that term isn't familiar to you, I, it will be by the time I've finished. Neoliberalism, neoliberal ideology is, is going to be the death of democracy if we allow it to go any further. And that more and more unelected, non-transparent, and um, illegitimate agents and organizations are taking over whole parts of what used to be the business of governments, of democratic governments. So finally, I, uh, in the third part, I would like to give you a great many examples of what I see as this illegitimate authority that is coming forward. Uh, and you'll see that it's, uh, it is to the point that this is going to affect all of our lives and all of our uh, countries. I'm a French citizen, I'm a fervent European, but I think that this Europe that we have now is, uh, is very dangerous and is going along with the neoliberal ideology as no government seen before, or at least not since the 19th century. So uh, what's needed, first part, and I'll do this very fast because it's going to sound to you like it's the course in the first introductory course in political science 101, and so let's just do very quickly uh, what makes a democratic government. Of course, um, all of us think first of free and fair elections, constitutional government, the rule of law, equality before the law of all citizens, all citizens treated alike, separation of the legislative, executive, and judicial branches, plus checks and balances to prevent any one of those branches of government from becoming too powerful. The separation of the church and the state is a very important component, but also accompanied by individual freedom of religion, freedom of expression, freedom of, of um, speech, and so on. And then, of course, we have the long list and the never-finished list of 
rights that began, it was first set out formally in the Declaration of the Rights of Man and the Citizen in France in 1789 and quickly followed by the first 10 amendments to the United States Constitution that make up the Bill of Rights. Uh, but even at that time, uh, the rights that were declared were not at all universal, including in the countries that made their revolutions. Women couldn't vote. Women had little, to partic little participation in government of any kind. Slavery still existed. I mean, you can all make the list. So this is the list that we have to make longer in every generation and grant more and more rights. And there is a, we're in a period now where sexual minorities are also claiming their rights. And I think this is just part of the march of human emancipation. Um, then there's something very important that happens, which is that these rights are all part of the movement which is called in German, if I'm pro I hope I'm pronouncing it right, the Aufklärung, the Enlightenment. And to me, we are, uh, we are moving further and further away uh, from the Enlightenment values. And that's also what I want to talk about. This movement can be dated from, the, it's usually dated from the 17th century, but certainly the invention of the printing press in 1440 contributed hugely to the dissemination of ideas. Uh, certainly the uh, Reformation contributed enormously, but mostly the philosophers of the Enlightenment begin in the 17th century, continue throughout the 18th and 19th, and it's only in the past 20 or 30 years that we have begun to lose the values that those, that those people and those philosophers and thinkers uh, so beautifully expressed. One of the most original parts of the Enlightenment is the idea of happiness. Thomas Jefferson, who wrote most of the Declaration of Independence, used the phrase of a sort that had never been seen before, said, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And he added that it was to preserve such values that men institute government. And the French revolutionary, Saint-Just, said, I'll tell you in French first, le bonheur est une idée neuve en Europe. Happiness is a new idea in Europe. And so it was. It was the idea that one could be personally happy, but also collectively happy through solidarity, through fraternité, through, through uh, caring for each other as, as citizens uh, should do. And of course, when I'm speaking about this, it sounds as though it's some sort of utopia. Uh, and I don't want you to think I'm not aware of the uh, of the horrors uh, of this same period, as you all are. Uh, we have had un un innumerable horrors, including uh, slavery. The same countries that where the Enlightenment was founded were the same ones that colonized most of the world, um, allowed slavery to continue. We've had fascist governments uh, in Europe. Uh, we have had... Um, the two bloodiest wars in human history, the Shoah, uh, and uh, from the time of the Industrial Revolution on an absolutely brutal economy which uh, used people up and threw them out. And these, these horrors still threaten us today to some degree. So democracy always was and always will be a work in progress. It, doesn't, it isn't something that you have. You can't say we have democracy. No, democracy is something we have to do and every generation has to do it differently and we all have to continue to create it all the time because it's very easy to, to, be, to be infected and to be swept away and that is what I fear may be happening now. Um, but we can tell that the Enlightenment values and democracy still have their appeal 
because all kinds of people are now revolting and trying to obtain the same things for themselves that they see in the already democratic countries, the Turks, the Arab Spring. Unfortunately, it's not enough just to overthrow a dictator, as we've all seen. Uh, but uh, we have had a considerable progress also because in Latin America in the 70s and 80s, many dictatorships were overthrown. And now the same slow process with setbacks and so on is, to, is happening in the Arab world. So, second part, why should we defend this model? Well, I think that we've got to improve it, uh, and we have, we're up against a new set of values, and this has only happened, as I said, over the last three or four decades. Uh, and this new set of values is, um, it, it's very strange, but those of you who are, let's say, 40 years old, even 45 or 50, you've almost not lived under any other period. And I keep forgetting that not everybody is as old as I am, thank God. Uh, and um, it's, uh, this is a model, the neoliberal model, uh, and its ideology is, is harmful to nearly everyone. It's a model for the rich, it's a model for the top people in the corporate sector. And I have to admit that I did not believe that after the financial crisis that began six years ago, that it could emerge even stronger from that crisis, but it has. It is stronger now than it was in 2007, 2008. And if I have time, I'll give you some proofs of that. But I've got a list of six proofs that can show you that that things are worse than they were before the financial crisis. But what we can see, and very easily, is that inequalities have increased. You can prove this mathematically if you look at the Gini coefficients. This is a number that, uh, that can tell you how unequal a society is compared to others. It doesn't tell you anything about the wealth in that society, but it does tell you how that wealth is distributed. And it's a, co it's, a, it's a number which is between zero and one. One is one person has everything. One person has all the wealth in the society. Zero is everybody has exactly the same thing. And the most progressive countries, including Austria, have always had in the high 20s, high point, 0 0.20, or in the early 0 0.30s. But, and they still, on, on the whole, uh, the Scandinavians, Austria, Canada, Holland, a few other countries still have quite respectable Gini coefficients. But in the United States, it's just going up every year. And the IMF, even the International Monetary Fund, is becoming alarmed about this. And should we care about inequality? I mean, lots of people simply say that, uh, well, so long as the floor is going up for everyone, it doesn't matter. Well, uh, yes, it does. It does, it does matter because um, we have a lot of characteristics of inequality which are um, going to hurt any society where inequalities increase. And I'll tell you a few of those effects in a moment. But just in terms of numbers, over the last 30 years throughout Europe, on average, labor, that is to say people who work for salaries or wages, have lost 10% of GDP, which has gone to capital, that is people who make money in their sleep through dividends, profits, rents. It used to be that labor throughout Europe was receiving 70% of the value added in GDP every year. Now it's down to 60%. In France, it's only 58. 
Uh, and and you, have, you can keep up with these figures, and you can see that in some countries it's 56. Uh, now, this isn't small uh, change. This is important um, in terms of money, because if you've lost 10% of the European GDP, you have lost one trillion three hundred billion dollars or thirteen hundred billion dollars which is no longer in the pocket of working people but has gone to capitalists <coughs> now how did the neoliberals manage to change the common sense how could they change the way people think I've done quite a lot of work on this. I published a book called Hijacking America, where I examined just how they did it. And what they did was um, to, to take very seriously the concept of cultural hegemony. Antonio Gramsci, of the Italian philosopher who died in a fascist prison in Italy in the 1920s, invented this concept of cultural hegemony. And by that he meant that you cannot win as a class. You can't rule just by oppression and force. You have to get into people's heads. And in order to occupy their mental space and the cultural space, you have to make what he calls the long march through the institutions. And that means taking over all of the places where ideas are developed, thought about first, developed, and disseminated. And that means the media, the universities, the schools, the church, the judiciary. It means any, even the family, any institution which contributes to creating the culture of a country or of a specific place at a specific time. And this is what these people understood. And I call them the right-wing Gramscians because uh, although Gramsci was a Marxist, and they're not Marxist at all, they really understood how to do this. And that's what they did. And the years I, I worked on were 1982 to 2002, and they spent a billion dollars doing it. But for them in America, that was nothing. That was very large fortunes uh, that were spent on paying people to think and to disseminate ideas. So what are some of these ideas that neoliberals have pushed upon uh, nearly everyone now? I, I was in Australia at the end of last month. And uh, uh, the neoliberal candidate just won the elections. This is all over the world now. Well, uh, here are a few things that they, they believe. As opposed to democracy, markets are wise. Markets are efficient. They tell citizens and governments what the public wants, what the public needs. They should be allowed to function free of government regulation or as much as possible because regulation... Uh, regulations are job killers. They use this term all the time. You put more rules in and that means fewer jobs. Uh, privatization of public services is always a good idea. Uh, private enterprise always outperforms public services on criteria of efficiency, quality, availability, and price. Free trade. Free trade may be will have some temporary, uh, will create pr temporary problems for some people, but on the whole, it will ultimately serve everyone and give greater wealth and greater, more jobs. And so tariff and non-tariff barriers should be cut. Uh, and we should also cut back, count on the market and cut back on government spending. Government spending is bad should be confined to a minimum, and deficits must be got rid of as quickly as possible, and all debts should be paid down immediately uh, by imposing austerity measures on the entire population. Now, this may not be that relevant to Austria, but it is very relevant throughout Southern Europe, 
It's relevant to France, uh, and it is happening in other cultures, such as Japan. Uh, and this ignores uh, just a few truths, like the fact that the standards of living go up. The greater government spending is, at least up to a point, the greater the number of jobs created. Public spending at all levels, municipal, province, national, federal, uh, is a source of jobs in the private sector. About half of all the jobs are created through government procurement and other government spending, and half of those are in the private sector. So, I mean, there's a lot of facts you can show that neoliberals don't know what they're talking about in terms of facts, but facts don't make any difference. Um, now, the values. The values of neoliberalism are quite opposite to those of democracy. I'll just make a few lists of them. There's no such thing as the common good. There is the sum of individual choices. Individual choices, in particularly in the marketplace, will show you what people want and need. They will tell you through their spending. And if people are poor, it's almost always their own fault. Uh, hard work and perseverance are always rewarded and you should be allowed to be free to make your choices, and if you make bad choices, then you should live with the consequences. Um, you should expect neither charity nor welfare payments, called always handouts, government handouts, or the nanny state, the nursemaid state. Uh, and responsibility is personal, it isn't social or collective. Now, it gives us a better idea of why Margaret Thatcher said in the 1980s, there is no such thing as society. There are only individual men and women, but there's nothing. You cannot identify something called society. That was Margaret Thatcher's ultra-neoliberal point of view. And the rich owe nothing to the poor. All of this comes from Friedrich von Hayek, who expressed it in a much more sophisticated way, but um, part of the neoliberal value, uh, value uh, collective is that wealthy individuals deserve their money. They should be taxed as little as possible, and they should keep virtually all of the money they've made, and we should be grateful to them because they invest and they create jobs by investing. That, too, is false. Uh, the wealthy individuals uh, already have practically all that they need, and they don't invest in buying things from the market that create jobs. They invest mostly in financial products, so they create very few uh, jobs, but tax cuts for the rich have become an article of faith now in neoliberal governments. Um, well, I, could, I can go on and on, and don't mistake me. I, I believe that personal responsibility is important. I believe that hard work and perseverance are important. I'm not saying that public services never need to be improved or reformed, uh, or, and that sometimes there is corruption. I know all of this. Once more, I'm talking about an ideal type, but I, I, and, but I think that that government is best, the economy is best when it is embedded in society and not the other way around. Society should not be embedded in the market. The market should be embedded in society and we should have mostly, insofar as possible, small and medium enterprises because they're the ones that provide most of the jobs. So what I'm going to... to well, I just wanted to sum up very quickly some of the effects of inequality, which are a characteristic of non-democratic societies where redistribution has virtually stopped, as it has stopped in the United States. And here again, you can see the mathematical correlations. You can see the way that the greater the Gini curve, the more the Gini curve goes up, 
the higher the Gini coefficient, the higher the curves also of the following phenomena that everybody would like to be without in a society, but there is more in unequal societies. There is more mental and physical illness, lower life expectancy, higher child mortality, crime, violence, suicide, addictions to drugs or to alcohol, prisoners per 100,000 population, obesity, school dropouts, teenage pregnancies, juvenile delinquency, all of this costs a society a lot. And the best way to get rid of it is to have a more equal society. Then the rates go down. This again is mathematical, but the neoliberals believe that there's nothing wrong with inequality. The rich uh, have deserved their money, and if someone is poor, they're poor because it's their own fault. So um, we've got now in Europe a, a real offensive against the welfare state. We have the European model, which uh, and I was brought up in the United States. I know both societies reasonably well. And um, I can tell you that the European model is the best one that exists on Earth at the moment. Maybe it's not the best we could possibly construct, but for the moment, it's the best thing that human beings have devised for governing. And this is under, this welfare state is under siege. It is becoming a dirty word to talk about welfare. It's as if you're saying, I don't know, something filthy. Um, and for the last, particularly since the financial crisis, the neoliberals have been winning. The banks are stronger. There are more financial products traded than ever before. There's a proliferation of financial products, especially derivatives and foreign exchange trading. There are more rich, very, very rich individuals than ever before. I'll just give you a few figures there. In 2008, right after the crisis, there, there's an annual report called the World Wealth Report, and it's very interesting to follow it because in 2008, the fortune of the collection of what they call the high net worth individuals, people who've got more than a million dollars to invest in liquid cash, they can, they can get it tomorrow and invest it. And anyone with over a million in liquid cash, it's not your house, your car, your boat, your art collection, it's just what you've got liquid. And so they grouped these people together and in 2008, there were, on, there were only 8.6 million of them in the world. Uh, their numbers had dropped a lot since the go-go years of 2006, 2007. Their numbers had dropped by 15%. And they had a collective fortune of 32, nearly $33 trillion. A trillion, let me take a moment to explain, it's one followed by 12 zeros. It's a thousand billion, if you prefer. Um, different languages express trillions in different ways. But I, I like to, to explain them by saying, look, if, you, if you're looking at your watch and you've got a second hand, and every second on your watch is a dollar or a euro or whatever, you can look at your watch for 32,000 years before you arrive at a trillion dollars. So these people in 2008, these 8.6 million people had just about $33 trillion. And here we are in 2012, only four years later, and we have 40% more of these very rich people, 12 million now, not eight point something, and their fortune is no longer 33 trillion, but 46 trillion, that's up by 40% too since 2008. And this World Wealth Report 
confidently predicts that by 2015, in another three years by their count, we, these rich individuals will have 55 trillion. Now, this, uh, one can also show that the creaming off of everything that has been gained since the start of the crisis has all gone to the top 1%. I was looking at, at several figures, but I'm not an economist. Uh, I poach on their territory a lot. I, I, I go and tread on their territory, but I'm not an economist, and so I was trying to make some sense of where, where's all the money gone. And I was very happy to see uh, just a couple of weeks ago, a column by Paul Krugman, who is a Nobel Prize winning economist, and he says it's all gone to the top 1%. And that shows you how much inequalities are increasing and how little democracy is doing uh, and how much the politicians are allowing uh, this, this fight, this onslaught, this offensive uh, against against the welfare state. Now, um, let me let me now go where I wanted, where I should have been ten minutes ago. But the most important thing, perhaps, about a democracy, is that it has to be based on the consent of the governed. The people who are being governed have to accept, have to consent, that this is a legitimate government. Now, what happens? if they can't identify who is governing, if most ordinary people are unable to, in, to identify who is governing, who is running what, how can they consent? They may like their government, they may hate their government, but if their government is handing over huge areas of policy to transnational corporations in particular, how can the people consent to being governed in that way? I don't think they can. And I think we have more and more entities exer ex exercising power, exercising power without uh, responsibility. Now let me take a few examples very quickly. Um, you all know about lobbies. We've had lobbies for at least two or three hundred years. The word comes from the fact that they used to stand in the House of Commons in the lobby and get the politicians as they were coming out and tell them, you know, you've got to do this, you've got to do that. That's where the word lobby comes from, because the lobby of the House of Commons. Um, well, it pays. And there was a survey recently in the United States that showed that companies that spent the most on lobbying had the lowest taxes. They manage to get loopholes, exemptions. Uh, it pays to, to be a corporate lobbyist. And the ordinary lobbies either lobby for one company or for a group of companies in the same sector, say the chemical industry or the automobile industry. But what's interesting is that at least in the United States, they have to sign up. The lobbyists have to sign up in a register, and they have to say who's paying them and how much. Not in Europe. In Europe, we only have a voluntary register. Now, if you are spending several million euros trying to get policies changed, and probably most people would not approve of what you are trying to do, are you going to sign up in a voluntary register and say, I am paying X firm three million euros to lower my taxes or to allow more dangerous chemicals in the atmosphere or to uh, allow unsafe vehicles? No, of course not. It's an obvious question. So in the, in the EU, we have uh, a very poor system and no, no means of control. Well, these are the ordinary lobbyists, but there's something more sophisticated now. Usually they call themselves institutes or councils. They have a nice neutral name. It sounds as though they're quite independent. But what they do is represent some of the more dangerous products. There's one for alcohol. There's one for tobacco. 
There's one for junk foods. Um, and they're mostly in Washington, but they work worldwide. And what they do, they have several, um, several tactics that are pretty much common to all of them. For example, the International Food Information Council. Doesn't that sound good? International Food Information Council, the Center for Alcohol, alcohol Policies. Uh, sounds great. The Tobacco Institute. Uh, and so on. Well, what they do is create fake groups of so-called citizens. These are what their opponents call astroturf groups, because in English, <coughs> you may know the word grassroots. Grassroots means it's coming right up from the people at the bottom. But astroturf is what you put in a stadium. It's fake grass. It's not real grass, it's just turf that's rolled out before, before a game. So they create astroturf groups, fake groups of citizens, who will go and protest, being paid to do so, or who will um, claim that they are being cheated of their freedom. Uh, they use fake, sci well, not fake scientists, but they use tame scientists, scientists who can be corrupted, to publish papers, <coughs> very rarely saying who is paying them for these papers, and which, whose only aim is to raise questions, to raise doubts about the most incontrovertible facts of science, whether it's about alcohol, whether it's about tobacco causing lung cancer, whether it's about junk food causing obesity or whatever, that is the kind of thing that they do. They buy scientists and they scare you. They say, if you adopt this policy, it's going to destroy jobs and it is going to threaten the freedom of the consumer to choose, etc., etc. Um, then there are... Uh, they, there are some that go farther than that. They are uh, and and are even more dangerous, not to our health, but to uh, the the quality of our society itself. Let me take finance. Finance is now so closely interlinked that it's become totally dangerous. There are three mathematicians at the Zurich Polytechnic. They are specialists in complexity theory, and they published a remarkable paper in 2011 called The Network of Global Corporate Control. These, these mathematicians start with a database of 43,000 transnational corporations. They want to see how they are interconnected, both upstream and downstream. How are they? interlinked, and they reduce this, they establish all the links, the methodology is complicated, I don't go into the details, but you can look at the paper, you can skip all the equations, I can't do any math, I skipped all the equations, it's still very clear. They reduce that number of 43,000 to 700 and some, 700 corporations that through their interlinkages, control fully 80% of the economy. Then what they're doing, you, you've seen maps of the sky, you know? Suns, big suns, big, uh, with planets around them. Um, supernovae sometimes, but systems. Some stars are very far away and very, very pale, and others are bright and have a lot of other stars grouped around them. That's what their map looks like. And in the center of this map, you have uh, 147 companies that still control 40% of the whole of the 43,000. And then only in the annex do you find a list of the 50 most interconnected companies in the world. And the kicker is that 48 of those companies are financial. They're either hedge funds, 
or big banks or other financial services companies. And this is what these mathematicians call the knife edge property. They are so interconnected that uh, I will quote what the mathematicians say in their paper. While in good times, the network is seemingly robust, strong. But in bad times, it, it can go into distress. Firms go into distress simultaneously. This, these are the 50 companies. Now remember Lehman Brothers. We're at the fifth anniversary of Lehman Brothers as we speak. It was yesterday, huh? 15th of September. And think of these 50 very interconnected companies which are so interconnected that if something happens to one of them, the whole pile of dominoes can go just like that and they are going to fall because they all owe each other money. They are all either owners of or uh, they are owned by, they own others, etc. People are still sorting out Lehman Brothers that had thousands of counterparties that either owed them money or to whom they owed money. And if you believe that the financial system is robust at the moment, I'm sorry to say that that is just not the case. So that's one of the things I worry about. Um, there are many others, but uh, that is a group of companies which is not regulated or very, very lightly regulated, and uh, I think we should worry about them. Well, um, we also have the ratings agencies, which uh, were largely responsible for the financial crisis. All of these toxic products based on mortgages that were given to very poor people who couldn't continue to pay them, and which were based on mathematical models that were totally un unreasonable, that were not scientifically sound. And they had risk factors of 2,000 or sometimes 20,000. They, why they didn't see this, I don't know. They're supposed to hire mathematicians, these people. But the ratings agencies, which are private corporations, are still handing out ratings, and they are still partly ruling the markets. I think this is dangerous, and I think this is a function that should be in public hands. You should not allow Standard & Poor or Moody's, which has uh, several thousand employees and made $2.7 billion last year in profits because they are profit-making private com companies. I don't think we should allow them to be able to give ratings to different corporate bonds or even government bonds or various financial products. If they weren't able to do it correctly last time, there's no reason to believe that they can do it correctly this time. Another interesting example is the International Accounting Standards Board. Now, I can see uh, uh, probably a lot of you want to fall asleep the moment you hear the word accounting. What could be more boring than going into accounting? Uh, well, we should be concerned about it because the International Accounting Standards Board is made up of people who came from or were, uh, yes, were employed by or are former employees or future employees of the big four accounting firms. Uh, and they are making the rules. Europe needed someone to make rules for the uh, uh, the uh, enlargement to 10 new countries, and they brought together an informal group. And then little by little, by 2005, this became an official group. And now it's, uh, it's got 100 countries that subscribe to its rules. Why is that serious? It's serious because we're never going to get rid of tax havens until we can get control over the international accounting standards that this board makes. Why? Because unless we can get country by country reporting 
so that a transnational corporation has to say, I made so much in sales in country X, I paid so much in taxes, I had so much in costs, including labor costs, until you can get that kind of information from every jurisdiction where that company is present, you will never be able to track down the transfer pricing and the tax juggling, evasion, avoidance, etc., that goes on because they are masters in putting their profits in countries where taxes are very low or non-existent and putting their losses in countries where the taxes are much higher. And here is what they say. Will they do country by country reporting so that we can see where the profits are actually being made and where the taxes or non-taxes are actually being paid? No, this is what they say on their website before they started public consultations, the IASB was asked to consider introducing country-by-country -country reporting requirements. The agenda consultation, they don't say who they consulted, the agenda consultation revealed little support for such a project, and we do not plan to undertake any specific work on this topic. Well. So we live with tax havens, which means that we all will have to do without the services that governments could have provided if they had been collecting taxes from the corporations. And it's now becoming a scandal in some places. Google hasn't paid any taxes in some countries for, for years. I mean, you can find examples of this in the United States. It's rampant, but it's also true in Europe. And now we've got another really, really difficult phase coming up, which is the two treaties that are being negotiated, both spearheaded, both uh, pushed by the United States. One is the Trans-Pacific Partnership, and the other that concerns us as Europeans is the Trans-Atlantic Partnership called the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership. It's not just trade, and the negotiations for this started in July in Brussels. Were you aware of this? Is everybody aware of this, that this is going on or not? I'm just curious. Yes? Yeah, good. Well, I mean, most people, not well, maybe not most people seem to be aware of it. Because the point of this is, that the tariffs between Europe and the United States are extremely low. They're about, they average about 3%. So this is clearly not about trade. Trade is important between the two continents. Yes, US and Europe, European trade is about one and a half trillion dollars a year. So that's important, and this is half the world's GDP concentrated in those two blocks, but, but, uh, we do not need to have a treaty about tariffs. So get the next word, investment. Trade and investment partnership. And that's the important word, because what they want is to reduce regulations. They want to have a treaty which is concerned with not the tariff barriers, but with the non, what they call the non-tariff barriers, or the behind borders barriers, and those barriers are barriers to investment or barriers to um, simply being able to sell anything you want to sell without regulation. One of the first cases that was brought to the World Trade Organization when it was founded, when it started in 1994, one of the first cases was the beef hormone case. You remember that? when the United States was shipping hormone-treated beef to Europe, and the Europeans, after a lot of, of, of uh, protest from citizens, said, we don't want to import hormone-treated beef. And this case went on and on and on, and it's still, uh, it's still not being litigated, but fines have been paid and so on. 
But they want to get rid of any kind of regulation like that so that we will get chickens from the United States which have been washed out with chlorine. Uh, we will get uh, meat that is full of antibiotics. Um, we, it, it's not just the food, you know. It, it's not just the, the food that, that will be dangerous. The point is that there will also be um, a lot of uh, uh, climate uh, uh, problems, uh, financial problems, because what they are going after is ceilings on regulations rather than floors. We don't know what the future is going to be like, and it's quite possible that our governments, having discovered, uh, or science having discovered new problems, will say, we are going to regulate such and such an area. We need to regulate much more against climate change. But if this treaty goes through, as it is now, this will become impossible because there will be a ceiling placed on regulation. Now, where does this treaty come from? It's the same for the Pacific one. This has been under negotiation since 1995, but not between governments, between transnational corporations on both sides of the Atlantic, organized in the US by the Business Council, organized in Europe by the European Roundtable of Industrialists and Business Europe, and these transnationals have been meeting since 1995, and they are uh, experts in saying these are the regulations we want. And they have come together and they have decided between themselves, the Europeans and the Americans, this is how much regulation we want. And now they're putting that on the table. And the, um, the transatlantic business dialogue, as it used to be called, is now the Transatlantic Economic Council. And the person who is the head of it said, I'm, I don't think I've got, have I got the quote? Let me see. So I hope I've got the quote. Um, the man who is the, is the head of it says, this is the first time, if I can find the exact quote, I will. I'm sorry, I should have had it in the, yes. Um, the Transatlantic Economic Council describes its job as, I quote, reducing regulations to empower the private sector. It calls itself a political body, and its director proudly declares that this is the first time, I'm still quoting, the first time the private sector has held an official role in determining EU-US public policy. Now, I think that that is a threat to democracy, and I hope you agree with me, because not only are they going to be setting ceilings on regulations in public health, on financial stability, on climate change, on an enormous number of other areas, but they have a clause which is now part of every bilateral and multilateral investment treaty which is called the Investor to State Dispute Resolution Article. And that means that an investor who believes that any government measure, any government legislation, which can have an adverse effect on their present or future profits, expected profits, can be sued. There were, the first year these things started, there were about 30 cases under arbitration. Now there are about 500. And as soon as these Trans-Pacific and Transatlantic treaties are signed, if they are, there's going to be an explosion of court cases, but not ordinary court cases, because the judiciary will be bypassed. 
these are tried in private arbitration tribunals. Well, I can't say private because one is part of the World Bank and the other, another is part of the UN system, but they are, they are tribunals with private law firm arbitrators and 20% of these cases have demanded from a government more than $100 million in compensation because that government dared to pass legislation which was limiting that company's profits. Now, this is maybe the most serious infringement of democracy. Not only do we have business saying we're making public policy, but we have governments which are going, al going along with this. They're accepting it. They think that's fine. And their judiciaries, although we have robust judicial systems in Europe and in the United States, we have honest judges and honest courts. This is not, we're not talking about some African uh, corrupt uh, system. But no, they're not going to use that judicial system. They're using private arbitration, which is extremely costly and can cost governments. Um, I think the highest settlement so far has been $3 billion. So all of these things point to me, for me, to um, an enormous fusion, uh, a kind of merger between governments and business. Let me quote you Peter Sutherland, who was a European commissioner, he's an Irishman, he was also president of Goldman Sachs, he's a man who's had a finger in many, many pies over the years. <coughs> and Peter Sutherland says about the European Roundtable of Industrialists, which has been involved in this, in this uh, negotiating process since, two th since uh, 1995, Sutherland says the ERT is more than a lobby group. Each member of ERT has access at the highest level of government. And no later than last March, Chancellor Merkel and President Francois Hollande uh, came to meet with uh, 15 of the members of the European Roundtable. And they asked them, Hollande and Merkel asked the ERT to contribute its wish list uh, to, the, uh, to the governments of Europe so that they could have a blueprint about what the companies wanted on competitivity, competition policy. And of course, the companies were only too happy to uh, oblige. This now seems to be normal everywhere. This is approximately what I wanted to say. I could go on if I had more time about the United Nations, which is now also infested with corporations. But I think Harold would like us to move on to the next, um, to the next part. And if you have a question about the UN, uh, I will. I will also. I would love to talk about that. But uh, thanks for your attention. And I hardly see anyone wearing earphones. So I guess we can have the the whole. Dis at least as far as I can see you, uh, we can have a discussion which I can either understand directly or through the very good offices of Alexandra. I will listen on this. So thank you very much indeed for your attention. And I hope we have a lively discussion and that you have criticisms, comments, and so on. Thank you. Ich darf auch noch Bildungsstadträtin Magistra Eva Schobesberger begrüßen. Sie ist in der vorletzten Reihe, bescheiden wie sie ist. Ah ja, genau. Uh, herzlich willkommen. Uh, Eva Schobesberger ist ja auch die Initiatorin dieser Reihe, also einen kurzen Applaus darf man ruhig auch anbringen, glaube ich. <lacht> herzlich willkommen. So, um, wir werden auf Deutsch sprechen, Anneliese, uh, und so wie ihr ja, wir werden auf Deutsch sprechen und es wird für Sie übersetzt und umgekehrt, uh, wer es braucht, offensichtlich brauchen es gar nicht viele, um, wird es für uns auf 
Deutsch übersetzt, wenn Susan George antwortet. Ich möchte mit meiner Kollegin Anneliese Edlinger beginnen. Also Kollegin, du bist Politikjournalistin, ich bin Kulturjournalistin, insofern sind wir jetzt nicht vom, vom Ressort her Kolleginnen, aber ähm, das, was zum Schluss auch angesprochen worden ist, ähm, das ist ja immer so ein, ein globaler Wulst an, un, an einem undurchschaubaren Dickicht, das einen ja, auch wenn man jetzt professionell damit zu tun hat, immer ein bisschen Angst macht. Wir stehen jetzt kurz vor einer Wahl in Österreich. Unsere Nachbarn in Bayern haben gerade auch gewählt. Ähm, denkst du, ist es... Ähm, auch für österreichische Bürger und Bürgerinnen äh, so ein bisschen das Gefühl, äh, wähle ich jetzt überhaupt noch ein politisches Konzept, ein demokratisches Konzept, eine Partei oder ist es tatsächlich so, eigentlich wähle ich äh, ein Wirtschaftskonzept oder womöglich sogar, wir kennen ja noch die Geschichten äh, der Lobbyisten in Österreich, also ist ja noch nicht so lange her, äh, dass da einiges ans Tageslicht kam. Ist das auch ein bisschen eine Demokratie oder auch eine Politikverdrossenheit in unserem Land, dass Bürger und Bürgerinnen sagen, eigentlich brauche ich nicht wählen gehen, weil ich wähle keine Politiker, keine Regierung in dem Sinn mehr? Naja, ich würde schon sagen, sehr viel von dem, was wir jetzt gehört haben, auf sehr hohem Niveau, lässt sich ja schön umlegen jetzt auf uns in Österreich. Jetzt haben wir einerseits, ich meine, Sie kennen das alle, da kommt jetzt ständig die SPÖ und propagiert äh, Vermögensteuern. Wer ein hohes Vermögen hat, soll mehr Steuern zahlen. Und die Finanzministerin, die ÖVP, reagiert gleich damit, ach, das ist so gefährlich, da würden alle abwandern. Und ganz interessant habe ich ja gefunden, die, die Firmen würden abwandern und das sei so gefährlich für den Wirtschaftsstandort. Also äh, da bewegt sich die Diskussion hin und her. Ich habe es sehr interessant gefunden, wie Sie, äh, Frau Schorczyk, gesagt haben, äh, die wichtigsten Unternehmen, die Arbeitsplätze schaffen, sind die kleinen und mittleren. Und die spielen aber keine so große Rolle. Es wird immer nur von den großen Konzernen gesprochen und wie gefährlich das sei, wenn die abwandern würden, äh, dass die kleinen und mittleren die Jobs schaffen, die Steuern zahlen, ist ganz selbstverständlich. Da hat man gar nicht so sehr das Gefühl, dass sie im Interesse der Politik stehen. Aber was ich Sie als eingehend fragen wollte, äh, Sie haben ja sehr deutlich klargelegt, äh, wie die Regierungen das Heft aus der Hand geben, die Politiker an die Konzerne, sich dort Rat holen. Und was uns schon auch immer auffällt in den verschiedensten Diskussionen mit Publikum, viele Österreicher sind politikverdrossen, sagen, ich will nicht wählen gehen, es ändert sich eh nichts, es entscheiden eh nicht die Politiker, die setzen eh nichts um. Und jetzt wollte ich Sie fragen, warum haben die, geben die die Macht aus der Hand? Ist es Angst, dass sie die falschen Entscheidungen treffen? Das tut ja keiner gern bewusst. Um, I think it's partly the neoliberal infection that I tried to describe. I think we, we're, we're in a period when um, this is a kind of cancer and the cells are proliferating. Maybe you know a play by uh, Eugene Ionesco, which was called Rhinoceros. And it's little by little, everyone in the society is becoming a rhinoceros. It's, it's a parable for fascism. But I think it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's contagious. And I don't know why people are becoming indifferent. What's happening in France is that they are choosing the extremes rather than because the, the standard middle of the road parties are so boring and so hopeless and don't decide anything that uh, they are moving towards the National Front, which is, is, uh, is a very dangerous development. But to go back to what you said about transnationals versus small and medium enterprises, uh, I don't know the unemployment rate here, but it's very high in France. It's, it's above 10% now. And let's not even mention Spain, Greece, uh, and so on. And we know that in Europe, um, 85 to 90% of the jobs are provided by the small and medium enterprises. We know this. And yet, And yet, the European Central Bank uh, 
has a survey. Every three months, they send out a survey to all of the, the big banks in Europe, 130 big banks. And they say, are you lending more or less to small and medium enterprises? Are you tightening terms of credit or are you loosening terms of credit? And ever since the middle of 2007, the surveys have always come back with a great majority saying we are tightening terms of credit and we are lending less to small and medium enterprises. Now, if that bank doesn't have a mandate from our European government saying lend to small and medium enterprises, we're going to have an unemployment crisis until hell freezes because that's what, they're, that's what the policy leads to. It's just, it's, it's very simple. And I can't answer your question. Why are governments giving up their powers? Partly maybe because of complexity. When I, when I speak, I hope everybody understood everything I was saying this evening because what strikes me is that when I started off being political, being a political animal, what we said was US get out of Vietnam and people either agreed with you or they didn't, but at least they knew what you were talking about. It was the same with stop apartheid. Uh, and, and now, if I say, oh, well, we've got to get rid of the IASB, <laughs> you know, they, <laughs> what's that? You know, it takes a little while to explain what is really in these treaties. It takes, it takes some time and it's a little bit complex. So, I think the first arm that we need as citizens is to be well informed, if, you know, as, as well informed as we can be. And journalists have a huge role to play in that, a huge role, because uh, if, if they write uh, articles which are not complex, don't use a lot of jargon, it's not difficult to understand these things, but you have to have I mean, nobody has enough time, except, uh, even I don't, you know, I do this as sort of a profession, but nobody has enough time to learn about all of these things. So we need people who can, who can help people figure out what's actually going on. Maybe the governments are just overwhelmed with complexity. Maybe they really believe it. Our finance minister really believes it, you know. In France, yeah. the finance, yeah. Uh, es ist sicher so, dass die Materie sehr komplex ist. Das hat ja Ihr Vortrag schon. Ich habe gesagt, es ist sicher so, dass die Materie sehr komplex ist. Da stoßen natürlich auch uh, wir Journalisten zum Teil an unsere Grenzen. Uh, Sie alle wissen ja, dazu erzähle ich Ihnen nichts Neues, die Krise in der Medienlandschaft. Viele Nachrichten, schnell, gratis, sollen verbreitet werden. Es gibt sehr viele Gratismedien, die nur sehr oberflächlich informieren. Es ist immer schwieriger, Nachrichten zu verkaufen. Aber andererseits muss man ja auch sagen, es gibt ja durchaus sehr viele kritische Kommentare. Sie haben es erst angesprochen, das Jubiläum, das Fünfjährige der Pleite von Lehman Brothers und äh, wie die Krise so richtig ausgebrochen ist. Also quer durch äh, alle Medien sind auch gestanden Aussagen von Experten. Noch immer sind die Finanzmärkte nicht reguliert. Noch immer sind die Banken zu wenig reguliert. Wir haben noch immer nicht die Finanztransaktionssteuer, das schwierige Wort, wo sich eh nur ein Teil der EU-Länder dazu durchringen konnte. Es ist ja nicht so, dass nichts aufgezeigt würde und es Kritik geben würde. Aber das Interessante ist, dass ja das in der Politik relativ... Ungehört Verhalt, es dauert alles so lange, wenn man nur das Beispiel Finanztransaktionssteuer nimmt. Ganz im Gegenteil, äh, ist es schlechter geworden, haben Sie auch dargelegt. Ne? Well. I, I, have, I have to laugh because I'm honorary president of Attac in France, maybe you said that in the introduction. And Attac, this is, this is what we started with. And that was 15 years ago. So when you say everything takes forever, I, I really agree. I couldn't agree more. Uh, but, uh, but at least, it, you know, they, it's as Gandhi said, they start 
by ignoring you, then they laugh at you, then they say, well, it might be a good idea, but it's technically impossible, and then they do it. But then Mario Draghi, what Gandhi didn't know, is that then Mario Draghi, the head of the, EC, the European Central Bank, comes in and says, we can give you a little technical help on this, which means we're going to tear it apart and we're going to fix it so that the banks don't have to, to do anything. I tell you an anecdote in France. Francois Hollande promised in his election campaign to cut the banks in two between the commercial banks and the investment banks. We weren't going to have ordinary people's deposits plus all of this floating, incredible leveraged cash doing very weird products. And they had hearings in the parliament. And all of the bank presidents came, the big, the big bank presidents came. And finally, one of them was honest enough to say, well, go ahead and pass your law. It's only going to affect 2% of our business anyway, so go ahead. Because they had watered it down so much, I mean, it, it, didn't, it didn't matter to him. And that's how far we've gone. And I think it's because this neoliberal doctrine has, go has gone through, they have understood about lobbying, they do it very well. Um, Philip Morris just spent, in 2012, in the first six months they spent $125 million, I think, or some huge amount uh, on, on all of the European deputies, all of the, the commission, et cetera, to get uh, a, a, tax, a, a bill on tobacco delayed, and they'll probably do it. They'll probably manage to do it. And so all of this works, you know. I mean, it's partly money, it's partly, but regulation could fix that. Just having a list of the lobbyists, a legal list that they had to sign and they had to say who's paying them for doing what and talking to whom, and you could consult that list as part of the public, and then you could come to an audience and like, like this and say, okay, uh, this company has just paid so much to get this law passed. You know, at least they can do that in the US. I don't say that many people actually read the congressional register of lobbyists, but, but you can do it. It is information you can get. Uh, so, um, you know, we're, we're uh, on, the same, on the same subject. It's why do our governments acquiesce? That's why people move to the extremes. They can see it, but they, but they have usually false solutions for it. They think they can get something better by, I don't know, leaving Europe or uh, following national front law or, or getting rid of immigrants or, you know, the false solutions. Mm. Einen Punkt, den du auch anges angesprochen hast, ähm, Journalismus als auch Teil dieser Krise, der so auf beiden Seiten auch immer ein bisschen steht und zwar wirklich auch dieser weltweiten äh, Krise äh, in den Medien, also der, weniger äh, Journalisten, die weniger bezahlt bekommen, die weniger Zeit haben, um wirklich gut zu recherchieren. Äh, es gibt da nämlich auch einen Punkt, äh, der offensichtlich fast niemandem aufgefallen ist, dass ähm, äh, Griechenland, ähm, die Griechenlandhilfe nach dem Artikel äh, 122, nach dem Lisbon-Vertrag äh, 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 geregelt wurde und da äh, ging es um ein a natural disaster. Es ist eine Naturkatastrophe. Das heißt, diese Griechenlandhilfe basiert quasi auch auf einer Naturkatastrophe und Banken sind völlig außer Obligo. Und ich denke mir, solche Sachen, über die stolpert man dann Jahre später als Journalistin und man fragt sich, warum hat das ist das niemandem aufgefallen. Also man fühlt sich da schon auch als Bürgerin ähm, auch im Stich gelassen und als Journalistin eigentlich noch einmal mehr desavouiert, weil man sich denkt, eigentlich bräuchte es da wirklich Kolleginnen und Kollegen, die die Zeit haben, genau solche Dinge zu recherchieren und auch ans Tageslicht zu bringen. Das ist sicherlich ein, 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 ein Punkt auch, wo man... Ja. Und, das, ja, und das braucht jemanden, der bereit ist, für guten Journalismus zu bezahlen. Ich muss das leider noch einmal sagen, Sie alle kennen diese Gratiszeitungen, die den Markt überschwemmen und auch einen Großteil des Werbeaufkommens nehmen und wenn Sie das so beobachten, interessanterweise auch sehr viel Einschaltungen von unseren Parteien haben. Es wird nirgends so viel geschaltet wie, ja, 
Braucht ja, die Namen klar. nicht nennen heute und Österreich ist eh egal, kann man ja sagen. Aber ganzzeitige Inserate, es ist schon sehr interessant. Das lässt schon den Schluss zu und das war natürlich immer so, dass Politik oft gar nicht so neugierig ist am Schauen hinter die Kulissen und dass man da lieber andere Medien füttert, die das nicht so genau machen, sondern die das schreiben, was man gerne hat als Politiker. Ich möchte auf eins zurückkommen, Mrs. Short, und zwar, Sie haben eingangs so also Werte beschrieben, Solidarität, Brüderlichkeit, gegenseitige Fürsorge, die man gar nicht mehr so oft hört in unserer Zeit. Man hat mir den Eindruck einer Entsolidarisierung, es wird geschimpft auf die Griechenlandhilfe und man muss da zahlen äh, für Menschen, die angeblich viel zu wenig arbeiten im Vergleich zu uns Nordländer. Äh, da wird geschimpft auf die Südländer und irgendwie hat man so, habe ich oft so den Eindruck, es ist so die Angst, mir geht es eh noch gut, ich habe eh noch einen Job, ich bin eh nicht angewiesen auf Sozialhilfe. Äh, Woher kommt diese Entsolidarisierung? Okay, I'm very glad you asked that because I know that a majority of Germans and I assume a majority of Austrians believe that we have been helping Greece. This is one of the biggest lies of the 21st century. Um, Attack Austria did a paper in which they show that 77% of all of the so-called aid that has gone to Greece has gone to the banks. Now most people think this is helping pensioners uh, or it's helping students or I don't know. <clears throat> they think, you know, they don't work. I, I, I know this language. This, I don't say all of the Greeks are working hard, and I'm not going to make a special case for Greece because they don't tax the church, they don't tax the ship owners, uh, they, uh, they pu pulled in a whole lot of new civil servants every time either the PASOK or the Neue Demokratika won an election, they brought in thousands of new civil servants. I'm not saying Greece is a sort of model country, far from it, but, What happens with the money is that we contribute, the Austrian government, the French government, and so on, to the European solidarity mechanism, right? That is then sent to the central bank, that money goes to the central bank of Greece, from the central bank of Greece it goes to the Greek banks, and from the Greek banks it goes to pay off the creditors who are the German, French, Netherlands, and British banks. That's the circuit of the money. But if you just use the European solidarity mechanism to hand that money to BNP Paribas, Deutsche Bank, Commerce Bank, uh, ABN AMRO, etc., people would notice, I think. So you, have, you make it a nice little circle like that. But that's what's happening. It's only paying back our banks. And, and so, um, The, the, the reality of politics is that it isn't, they, they make you hate the people who are not responsible, who had nothing to do with creating the crisis in the beginning. They, people bought Greek bonds. Why? Because all bonds were labeled in euros. So they thought, fine, I get a slightly better interest rate If I buy Greek bonds, then if I buy German bonds or Austrian bonds, I get more money back. So I'll buy Greek bonds. Nobody forced them to do that, but everybody said, oh, but it's the same thing. They're in euros, right? So you could perfectly well buy Greek bonds. So Greece was selling bonds like, like chocolates. You, know. you see what I mean? I'm clear. Is the audience, does the audience see what I mean? Ja, ja, aber diese, diese Entsolidarisierung, jetzt einmal abgesehen, äh, Sie haben das jetzt eh genau erklärt, wie, wo die Gelder hingehen, aber die gibt es ja nicht nur in puncto Griechenland, die gibt es ja auch bei uns. Wenn es bei uns heißt, äh, wir können uns den Sozialstaat nicht mehr leisten. Ah, 
da gibt es ja auch viel Zustimmung. Äh, oder Why can't you afford it? Mm. Why? Äh, ich Why? Are taxes, uh, are taxes being avoided, maybe? Um. Nein. Uh, are the rich people paying their fair, fair share? Are corporations paying their share of taxes? How much did Austria pay to, uh, to bail out its banks? Es ist ja so, es ist ja so, dass man in sich, man, man kann sich den Sozialstaat leisten. Es ist ja nicht so, dass es nicht so wäre, nur es wird jetzt anderem der Vorzug gegeben. Es heißt, damit nicht das mit uns passiert, was in den Südländern passiert ist, wir müssen die Schulden reduzieren, wir müssen da abzahlen und weniger Geld fließen lassen oder zumindest einmal nichts in nächster Zeit in Bildung, in das Sozialwesen, in Gesundheit. Das ist ja auch bei uns zu bemerken. <lacht> 